Well, we are, we are excited about, more than anything else, about what God is going to do in your lives this week. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to anticipate a move of God in your heart and in your life. How do you do that? Well, you could start by writing down what you're believing God to happen in your life. Write it down. Get a piece of paper and say, God, I am believing you for this and this and this and this this week. I'm believing you for answers in this area of my life, for direction in this area of my life, for wisdom in this area of my life. I'm believing you, God, for a better relationship with my mom and dad. I'm believing you, God, for a better relationship with my brother and sister. Don't write down, Lord, kill my brother and sister. Get them out of my life. Don't write that down, okay? Because God doesn't hear prayers like that. He doesn't answer them either, okay? Write down. That's how you start. I want you to anticipate a move of God in your life this week, but I want you to be specific, all right? Now, if you're 12 years old and you're believing God for a husband, all right, relax. Relax, please. Relax. You're not an old maid. It's going to be okay. Some of you are getting kind of worried. If you're 25 years old and you're not married, don't worry about it. God's got the perfect person just for you. It's going to be awesome. Right, Stephanie? Where did she go? She's right there. He's looking for you. Amen. Amen. He's looking for you. Write it down. All right. Now, the next thing that I want you to do is turn up your anticipator. Turn up your anticipator. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Turn around and look at someone and say, something's going to happen. Look at someone else and say, something's going to happen. Man, who knows what could happen to you this week? Who knows? Wow. Who knows what might happen this week? Good gracious. Somebody here might give you a car. You wouldn't have to drive home with all those other people this week. There's a 10-year-old kid in here going, yes, yes. But I want you to get up your anticipator. I, I, I wouldn't mind you getting a car at 10 and practicing in it until you turn 16. That'd be okay, wouldn't it? That'd be all right. Or 12 or some of you are 17 and you still need a car, right? And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe it? I mean, do you really believe it? I want you to anticipate God's word coming to pass in your life this week. Write down what you're believing God for and turn up your anticipator. Everywhere you go, every time you walk into a new room, look around. Check it out. Say, God's going to bless me in here. When you walk into the restaurant, go, God's going to bless me in here. When you go back to your hotel room, go, God's going to bless me in here. Here's what I want you to be aware of. When we're done with the meeting here tonight, the meeting's not done. I'll say that again. When we're done with the meeting here, the meeting's not done. God will go with you back to your room. Bad, God will go with you back to your home. And God will stay there with you and minister to you, and it'll be awesome. Can you imagine God filling up your room with himself? Would that be cool or what? Some of you said, oh, I'd wet the bed. It'd be terrible. No, it'd be awesome. He'd work in your life and it'd be incredible. So I want you to do those three things for me tonight. Write down what you're believing God to do in your life this week. Turn up your anticipator. And I want you to know that when the meeting's over, God's not done yet. Okay? If you'll do that, then you'll walk in the presence of God all week long. Hallelujah. Good stuff. Well, bow your heads. We're going to get into the Word. But before we do, we're just going to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit and His anointing on the Word tonight. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You that it's alive. Thank You that it's full of power. Thank You that it's changing us. Let it change us. We yield to Your Word. We yield to the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge Your presence here. And we believe you for supernatural revelation and a thrust into the things you have for us in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Turn in your Bible to 2 Peter 
chapter 1, 2 Peter 1. As I was praying and getting ready for these meetings here, you know, this is a, this is a different kind of a group of young people here. You're not the same as any other group in the world. You're not. Why? This is a believer's convention. It's a believer's meeting. It's a meeting full of young believers, young men and women of God who believe His Word. So in preparation for this week, God spoke to my heart, and He said, here's what I want you to minister to my young people on. Preparing for ministry. Preparing for ministry. I said, Lord, preparing for ministry, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Some of these kids are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Preparing for ministry? The Lord began to show me what he meant. God wants to unleash this generation on the world, and he wants to do it now. He doesn't want to wait till you turn 18. He doesn't want to wait till you turn 21. He wants to do it now. Therefore, you need the instructions on how to prepare for that ministry. You know what ministry is? There's several different kinds of ministry. I'll just touch on these a second, and then we'll read this. There's ministry to God. Did you know you can minister to God? We just got done ministering to God. God loves it when you worship Him. How many of you girls have a boyfriend? Okay. Has your boyfriend ever come up to you, looked you square in the eyes, <laughs> looked you square in the eyes and said, you are the most important thing to me in the world? How did you feel? I mean, if he did, you know, some of you, a bunch of young people raised their hand. It's like, girls, I have a boyfriend. And sometimes in the younger age ranges, you can tell someone likes you if they hit you. You remember that? Those are the monkey bars days, all right? You remember those monkey bars days where you ran around, you chased the girls, you caught them, and you put them in the monkey bars? You are mine. Oh. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, you remember that. You remember those note days, too. I love you, do you love me, yes or no, circle one. Remember those notes? Well, we've grown. We've gotten beyond that. And it feels good when somebody sits down. I mean, it feels good when your mom and dad say, you know what, you got, you kids are the most important thing to us in the world. I mean, it makes you feel good. Makes you feel good when your friend comes up to you and says, you know what, you are the best friend that I've ever had in my life. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? Makes you feel good. You know what, it makes God feel good when you go to him and say, God, you are Lord, you're in charge. You are more important to me than anything else in the world. And God goes, yes, that's great. Why? He loves it when you worship him, when you give him your attention. And when you tell them things like that, that's ministry to God. You minister to him. Guess what happens when you minister to God? He ministers to you. You give God what you have, God gives you what he has, and who has more? Who has more, you or God? You know, it's not really fair. We don't have a whole lot. Just give him our time, give him our attention, and he gives us everything. 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 I'll show it to you here in the Word. Preparation for ministry. We're going to talk about quality faith tonight. Look at this in 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Excuse me. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read through this. I want you to keep your spiritual ears open to what God would say. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is blind and cannot see far off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. How many of you want to never fall? You know, in the body of Christ right now, we've seen in the last bunch of years, ministers fall. Well, if God is calling you as a young person and as a generation to ministry, you want to make sure that you're doing things correctly so that you do not fall. The worst thing could be is if you spent all of your time, all your energy, all your attention, all your prayer life, everything, moving in this direction to develop a ministry, to be able to be used by God and do things for the Lord, and then fall. If you fall, you can get back up, but wouldn't it be nicer to never, ever fall? Wouldn't that be great? He gives you the instructions right here on how to never fall. He says here in verse 10 again, Give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. There is a calling, there is an election, there is a prophetic anointing on this generation. Why? Because you guys are the fulfillment of prophecy. God prophesied your existence a long time ago, before you ever even thought about being here. God said, I'm going to take a generation, I'm going to use them, and I'm going to make them the most powerful thing the world has ever seen. A group of young people that are selfless, that are not thinking about themselves, the only important thing in their life is Jesus Christ. God's raising up that generation, and I believe you guys are right in the middle of it. I believe that. When I was growing up, there was no youth ministry like there is today. There were no youth groups like there is today. Our youth group consisted of sitting in a circle in a room, doing some charades, singing Kumbaya, and watching some old movie that tried to scare the hell out of you. Literally. They, that's what they were trying to do. They didn't want you to go to hell. They wanted you to go to heaven, so they tried to scare it out of you. Here's what's going to happen in the last days. We're going to hack people's heads off. Chop, 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 chop. Are you scared yet? Then we're going to pull out their guts and lay them all over the street. Chop, chop, chop. You know, it's like, ah! And it's like, I want to go to heaven because I don't want that to happen to me. When I was growing up, that's what it was like. There, there wasn't any excitement in it. There wasn't like youth groups with names and bands and preachers and, and gifts to the body of Christ. It was like nothing. We went on ski trips, or not even ski trips. We went sledding down the hill. And that was like the extent of our spirituality. There was no Christian rock back then, so we used regular rock. We had a rock concert in the basement of the church. How spiritual. In a garden of Eden, honey. Yeah, we worship you, whoever you are. I mean, somebody. There wasn't youth ministry. Something's changing. Something's happening. Every year it gets bigger. It gets stronger. It gets more powerful. I mean, this summer I've been to Australia. I've been to... Anaheim. I've been over to Christ for the Nations to Youth for the Nations Conference. I've been up to Tulsa to Youth America speaking up there. And I'm seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of young people just like you saying, I want what God wants for me. I have a calling on my life. I have an election. God has elected to choose me and I want to be in the middle of it. And being in the middle of it means you want to be successful at it. You want to be good at it. You don't want to fall. God's not waiting for anything except for you to say, I will. Here am I, send me. That's all he's waiting for. You could be a preacher right now. I'll say that again. Some of you look shocked. You could be a preacher right now. 
right now. You know what the power of God is? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those that believe. If you don't preach the gospel, there will be no power. That's the way it is. It's going to take somebody proclaiming a message to make the difference. Okay, so you have a calling. He says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. What is he talking about? How are we going to do this? He gives you all the elements here. He starts off in verse 2. Let's look at this closely. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power has given. Everyone say, has given. Look at someone and say, has given. What does that mean? It means it's already done. It's already been accomplished. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that has called us. He's called us. He's called us. I want you to say that. He's called us. God has called you. And he's provided the equipment for that calling. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You don't have to go through life struggling, 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 trying to be like God, falling on your face, trying again and falling on your face, trying again and falling on your face. You don't see the disciples doing that after they got full of the Holy Ghost, do you? Now, before Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead and came back and they got born again, they got spirit-filled, before that time, you see him falling down. You see Peter doing stuff like, Lord, I'll never deny you. No, I'll never go back. I'll even die for you. Do you know him? No, never heard of him. Bam, right on his face. He fell. Why? He wasn't equipped. He didn't have the right equipment. God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I want you to realize this for a minute. I'll just spend a minute on this. God wants to provide all of your needs so that you can do what he's called you to do. God wants to provide for you so you can bring other people to church so they can hear the gospel, the good news. God wants to provide for you a testimony. God wants to provide for you in such a way that people will look at you and they'll be excited about what's happening in your life and they'll want what you've got. That's hard to do when you've got holes in your clothes, you've got a runny nose, and zits all over your face. You go, I'm a Christian, want to be like me? And they go, not really. Why? It's not a test. Do you know you don't have to have pimples? I, I still get attacked with pimples every now and then. You know, a, a big old, you know, wad of a zit trying to crawl up under your skin. I hate those things. By his stripes you were healed. From what? From everything. From everything. It's going to be kind of hard to walk into school. <laughs> And you're going to go share Jesus with them? And mucus, right? God wants you to be strong, to be healthy, to have your needs met. He wants you to be blessed so you can be a blessing. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Don't put him off till you're older to see these things come to pass. Some of you are thinking in your mind right now, yeah, but I don't have a job. You know what you've done? You've attached the blessings of God to a job and it doesn't work that way. You don't have to have a job to be blessed. You don't. You don't have to be employed somewhere in order to have money coming in. My sons are 10 and 12. They have their own business and they have invested in mutual funds. They're doing okay. Why? Because I believe with all of my heart, and our whole family does, that you don't have to have a job in order to be blessed. You don't have to be employed by somebody. Employ yourself. Some of you girls, how many of you girls babysit? Make it a business. 
Hire your friends. Hire them out. I mean, you just get all the phone numbers, get it all together. You'll be the calling central. You get a percentage of all of it. And you're 12. Why not? God will show you how to do it. Make God your partner in the business. God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And if you'll spend time with him, he'll give you the ideas that you need in order to get where he wants you to be. Then when you walk in, people are going to look and say, man, how, how'd you get so blessed? I mean, how did all this stuff happen? How come you always have everything? You say, God has given unto me all things that pertain to life and godliness. I believe God is raising up teenage millionaires in these last days because from the time they were four years old, they brought their change, stuck it in the offering, and started believing God that young. I believe that. You want to be one of them? I guess not. Oh, well. <laughs> Wrong group. Do you want to be one of them? Okay. All right. He has called us. To glory and virtue. Verse 4, here's the key. Whereby are given unto us, past tense again, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The tools that God has given you to overcome every circumstance and situation, to lord it over every sin that tries to come across your path, the tool that God has given you so that you might hook up with Him and begin to receive some of His nature and His character on the inside of you, His promises. His promises are the tools. His promises. God's word is full of exceeding. You know what exceeding means? You want some money or you want some exceeding money? Exceeding is like way beyond what you needed. You go, Mom, can I have some money for lunch? I need to have lunch and school lunch costs about two bucks. Could I have some money for lunch? She goes, sure, honey. Here's a hundred. That's exceeding. Turn 16. Mom, Dad, I've been thinking about, I've been saving up some money uh, to get a car. I don't have a whole lot. I'm thinking about getting a Volkswagen, you know, something that runs, you know, something that I don't have to pull start like that, but that I can turn a key, have keys to. And I've been thinking about getting something. Could you help me pick one out? They go, okay, come here. And they take you out the front door and they pull this sheet off, this big pile of something in the front yard, and it's a Lincoln Continental. Exceeding. You go, well, I, er, um, gee. Thank you. That'd be exceeding. That'd be way beyond what you were trying to ask for. That's how God's promises are. You ask for a little bit, and His promises cover so much more. Exceeding great. Great promises. These promises are great. Why are they so great? Because they take care of it all and give you more than you need and put you in a position where you can be a blessing to others. Great. Exceeding great. See... <laughs> You can go beyond. Some of you are going, oh, God, give me a car, give me a car, give me a car. Oh, God, I want a car, I want a car. Lord, when I turn 16, I want a car. Lord, when I turn 15, I want a motorcycle so I can get around and go to my friends' houses and all this. God wants you to go beyond. Do you, know, do you realize that's little thinking? That is small thinking. That is so small. Here's big thinking. God blessed me so much that I can give all my friends a car for graduation. Now that's big thinking. Why? God wants you to be blessed and he wants you to be a blessing. Lord, I want to give my best friend a car. God will give you two cars. Is that cool or what? Please, young people, please. We are in a day and an age when we're going to have to exceed. We're going to have to go beyond. We're going to have to think a little bit bigger than we've ever thought before. Why? God's got a big job out there for us to do. You look at the drug dealer and the dope you know, smokers and all these guys at school, and you look at them and you think in your mind, there is no way that person could get saved. You want to bet? Do you want to bet? 
That person could become the key to revival in that school because of you. You just go up to all you got to do. All you've got to do is give God a chance. Walk up to him and say, hey, do you know that Jesus Christ loves you? And they'll cuss you out and they'll swear at you and they'll give you the finger or maybe two fingers or three. You know, they'll just get all over your case, kick you out, get all mad at you. And you go, well, God bless you. And then you see him again the next day and you walk up to him and you go, you know what, Jesus Christ loves you so much. And they get all ticked and they get all mad and you just keep coming back. All of a sudden they get saved and the whole school gets saved. We're going to have to think bigger, bigger. Big, well, I couldn't do that. You want to bet? You could too. You could do that. It's so easy. It's so simple. Wear your Christian t-shirt to school. Walk in, they say, what does that mean? And you just tell them. It's so easy. God's given us his promises so that we could take hold of his promises. It says, everywhere the sole of your foot treads, that have I given to you. Past tense. Past tense. You need to go home and walk on your school. Hello? Hello? Are you there? You need to go home and walk on your school. Take your shoes off. Go up to the wall of the school and go, in Jesus' name. And Jesus, everywhere the sole of my foot shall tread. God has given it to me. God has given it to me. God has given it to me. God's given you to me. God's given you to me. Oh, in Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Here we go. Everywhere. I, the Bible said it. I didn't make it up. The Bible says it. The Bible says it. Everywhere the soul, you know, go around, put your shoes on your friends. Unsaved friends. Hey, you're not saved? You're not saved? Hey, praise God. God bless you. Everywhere the soul, I mean, God said, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. Go find a heathen, put your shoe on him. You'd be amazed at what happened. Well, what if they hit me? Well, bleed. Think bigger than you've ever thought before. His exceeding great and precious promises, he's given them to you. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need. I like what the Amplified says. My God shall liberally supply and fill to the full your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything you'll ever need. How many of you got some needs in your life tonight? You got needs in your life? God will supply your every need. Every single one of them exceedingly some of you are thinking well why doesn't he do it because he's given you the tools by which you can get a hold of him what are they the exceeding great and precious promises you take his promise and you believe it and it comes to pass in your life his promises his promises by his promises you become one with God's nature and by his promises you escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. If you've been having a struggle with sin, get a hold of some of his promises. Get a hold of over in Romans, it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law. You are under grace. So when sin comes along, you tell it. You say, sin, I have a promise. You will not have dominion over me. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And that promise will take hold in your life and make all the difference in the world. So he's given us his promises so that we can stand up against these things. Now look at verse 5. Beside this, besides these promises, and for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. This is a generation to be diligent in. This is a generation that no longer are you going to be able to just breeze through every little thing that comes along. When a challenge comes, you're not just going to be able to breeze through it. You're going to have to be prepared. You're going to have to be ready when the challenge comes. How are you going to get ready? Diligently. You have, any of you ever studied for a test? How did you study? 
Some of you waited till the night before, right? You waited till the night before and studied all night long. Oh, God. Yeah, have mercy. Help me pass this test. You will stop lying, you will stop distracting, and you will stop hurting these young people. You can't have them. You cannot have them. And the young man that is in here right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, that he has been going through such a heavy-duty situation, and he has no way out, and he can't see up from down, and he doesn't know how he's going to get out of that situation. I break the power of sin, and I break the power of Satan off of him right now. In the name of Jesus, I release him right now. Right now, in his heart, the power of sin is broken off of him in the name of Jesus. Father, I take him. I snatch him out of the fire, and I claim his soul and his heart for the kingdom of heaven right now in the name of Jesus. Games with him. He's serious. He is seriously trying to wipe out a generation and to stop you from... He's trying to stop you. Some of you, you walk out the doors here tonight when we're through. Some of you are going to walk out these doors, and the devil is going to try to steal this word from you. He's going to try to snatch it right out of your heart. Don't let him do it. You don't have to let him do it. Some of you walk out, oh, oh, wow, oh, yeah. Diligently take hold of the promises of God. Now, this is what he says. This is how it begins. He says, diligently add to your faith. Add to your faith. How many of you have faith? Diligently add to your faith, and then he gives a whole list of things. Faith is where you start. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. The Word of God is the promises of God. That's how you get faith. If you need more faith, you need to get more Word. If you get more Word, you'll have more faith. It's that simple. Shut off the TV. Turn off the radio. Get alone with your Bible. Get out the Word. I'm not talking about one time. I'm not talking about just taking an afternoon and one time getting the Word. I'm talking about diligently adding to the faith that you already have. What would be horrible is if we stood before the Lord and all we had was a little bit of faith and no results. You have faith. You have it. It's yours. It's in you. I want to show you a couple of passages concerning faith that will tie into this. Look at verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter uh, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this word precious, uh, some of you girls, how many of you girls have a cat or you have a little pet, a hamster or something? And you go, oh, it's so precious. That's not what this word here means. It doesn't mean cute. It means valuable. Those who have obtained like precious faith, you've gotten a hold of something that's valuable. What if someone gave you a diamond? Would that be valuable? Yeah. What if you worked and worked and saved and worked and bought yourself a diamond? It would be much more valuable, even if it cost the same. Why? Because it cost you something personally. Precious. Diligently adding to your faith will cause a value to increase on it. Now look over at Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members don't have the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now it says here in the end of verse 3 of chapter 12 that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. But look at who he's talking to. In verse 1 he says, I beseech you, brethren. Who is he talking to? Brethren. He's talking to people who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So these are believers. So when he says, God has given to every man the measure of faith, then he goes in and talks about we as one body. He's talking to believers. God has given to every man the measure of faith, every man, every person, every man, woman, and child, that has become born again of the Spirit of God, God has given to them the measure of faith. This is supernatural faith. This is the seed of faith that's planted in each and every heart when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that faith, what you do with that faith, is going to make the difference in how your life turns out. Faith is going to be the key to make it all work out. Faith in what? Faith in the promises of God, these exceeding great and precious promises. People in the world don't have this faith. To them, it's silly for you to believe in a God you can't see. But I believe in him. He's more real than I am. Did you get that? Some of you think that this is it. Everything you can see, this is it. No, there's a completely different world happening in here right now simultaneously. There's angels all over the place. The Holy Ghost is here. The Spirit of God is here. And it's, a, it's coexisting in this room with us right now. The angels of God are busy right now. They're running around doing stuff. And outside these doors, there's a bunch of demons trying to figure out what we're doing in here. It's happening right now. That world, that realm was here before you and I ever got here. It existed before this realm ever had any existence. It's real. Heaven is so real to me. Oh, man, I am just, I am ready to zip into the other side. I am ready to just step through this curtain between the world of the flesh and the world of the spirit, and I'm out of here. I can taste it. I want heaven so bad, I want it. Why? It is so real to me. I'm going there. I'm going to live there. That thing is more real to me than any of you are. Heaven is real. God is real. God has given to every born-again person this measure of faith. But God hasn't given everyone the measure of faith, not heathen, not unbelievers. I'll show it to you. Turn over to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians. You say, boy, we're reading a lot of Scripture verses tonight. We're going through the exceeding great and precious promises. You better get used to it. You know what we're going to do in heaven? going to hear God's word. You think we're never going to do this again once we get to heaven? No, we're going to do this some more. Have you learned everything yet? No, you sure haven't. We're going to learn some more when we get to heaven. We're not going to be done yet. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So we read in Romans chapter 12 that God has given to every man the measure of faith. We read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that all men have not faith. The people who he's talking to in Romans chapter 12 are believers. The people who he's talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 are unbelievers. Unbelievers don't have faith. Believers have faith. So once you became born again, you received the Spirit of God into your life, born again spirit, 
you received the capacity to use faith. You got a measure. It was measured out to you. Now, I like what the Amplified Version says. The Amplified Version says, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. I've mentioned several different times tonight about finances and about cars and about things, and I use those as illustrations to relate to you and to your world. But God is calling this generation to a higher calling, a bigger thinking beyond the natural realm. God wants you to take this faith that he's given to you. He wants you to take hold of this faith And he wants you to exercise your faith in developing these attributes and building them into your life. And if you will develop these attributes and build them into your life the way that he has designed and outlined in this passage of Scripture, you will never fall. Ever. It doesn't matter what they throw at you. It doesn't matter what they do to you. It doesn't matter what they call you. It doesn't matter what circumstances surround you. You will never fall. You'll be solid as a rock. Jesus was like this. He wasn't moved by circumstances and situations. His disciples were moved by circumstances and situations. Over in Luke chapter 17, Jesus says, look, disciples, I'm telling you that if somebody sins against you and asks you to forgive them 70 times in a day, 70 times 7, forgive them. 490 times a day. If they sin against you, if they hit you, if they hurt you, if they come against you, if they call you names, and then they say, forgive me, forgive them. 490 times a day. Right after that, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Why did they say that? They didn't believe they could do that. Simple, simple thing. I forgive you. I let it go. I forgive you. I forgive you. Someone comes up and gets mad at you and yells at you. You say, I forgive you. What is that? Strong and immovable. These particular attributes that we're going to look at this week are the attributes that God wants to build in you. These are the things that God wants you to use your faith in getting planted and established on the inside of you so that you, you know, you, maybe you're standing there and your friend's in trouble and you just walk out there and deliver them. That's what Jesus did. He's up on a mountain. His friends are out in the middle of the sea in a storm. The waves are coming over the boat. They're getting ready to drown. And they all believed they were going to drown. Yes, we believe we're all going to die. But Jesus saw his friends out there. What is he? Solid as a rock, but lighter than air. He says, my friends need help. So he walks out there, and he just walks out onto the water, walks out in the middle of the ocean. One particular translation, it says he looked like he was going to pass the boat. He's just zipping along through the waves. It looks like he's going to pass them. And they go, hey, wait a minute. Peter said, if it's you, let me come. Jesus said, come on. It's cool out here. This is great. We'll ride the waves together. Strong, immovable. What do you do in a storm? What do you do when everything comes down on you? What do you do when everybody yells at you, your teacher yells at you, your parents yell at you, your little brother sticks peanut butter in your dog's ear, and, you know, you don't know what to do. I mean, you're totally ticked at the whole world. What do you do? What do you do? Are you strong? Are you immovable? Or do you fall into the trap? And the snare, the lie. The devil's trying to get at you. What are you going to do? I like what Smith Wigglesworth did one time. This is a guy earlier on in the century, tremendous man of God. Heard a noise in his basement one night. So he got his lantern. That's how long ago it was. He got his lantern. Went over to the steps, walked halfway down the steps, held up his lantern, and there was the devil. Satan himself manifested so he could see him. In his basement, Smith Wigglesworth holds up the lantern and looks and sees him. And he went, oh, it's just you, and went back to bed. Strong, 
immovable. If Satan manifested himself to you, some of you would freak out. And some of you would know exactly what to do. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get out of my presence. Strong. What are these attributes? What is this stuff? Here's the first one. We're going to do this first one. We're going to wrap it up for tonight. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. Virtue. Everyone say virtue. The V word. Virtue. You know what virtue means? Here it is. Virtue. Moral excellence, value, quality of life, merit, acting, power, and praise. Excellence. God has virtue. What is it? It's excellence. God has virtue. What is it? Quality. What does he mean when he says employ every effort to exercise your faith in developing virtue? See, you can have cheap faith. Did you know that? Did you know you can have cheap faith? God wants to have value, valuable faith. Faith that you just got, you went to camp, you got saved, you got born again, and it didn't cost you nothing. You haven't used it, you haven't utilized it, you haven't worked with it, just cheap faith. God wants you to have faith that has value to it, and we're going to pick this up tomorrow night and start right here again tomorrow night. I want you to bow your heads. Spencer and Cindy Nordyke, Reaching Nations and Generations. For more information, visit nordykeministries.com.